Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Lost Connections by Johan Hari, Why You're Depressed and How to Find Hope. Johan Hari, he was an uh, 18-year-old kid and he went to see his doctor. Uh, and the reason was that he'd struggled to remember a day where he didn't feel like crying. And he's saying it wasn't just this small little fear tears, it was he big, proper, legit sobs. He'd take himself to his room, he'd lock himself away from the world and just start crying most, most days, in fact. And he thought, well, I, pr- I should probably go talk to someone about this. It was a real epiphany the day he realized that he was depressed. You know, he told himself, finally, it's not in my head, I'm depressed, I'm not unhappy, I'm not weak, I'm just depressed. He said it gave him this sort of sense of relief, the sense of relief that he, he now had a name for it, he now had this story around it that he could say that it wasn't just that he, was, he couldn't cope with everyday life, it wasn't just that every day he had to go and lock himself away and cry, he actually had this medical diagnosis that he could hang his hat on. So, Johan, he, he was uh, growing up in the, I think, what, 80s or 90s, but his teenage years coincided with the age of Prozac. And it was the dawn of these new drugs that had this promise for the first time that people around the world could have this cure to depression without the side effects. So there was best-selling books at the time like Better Than Well and it was this belief that these drugs made you stronger and healthier than you see a typical ordinary people. And he soaked it up. He loved hearing about all that stuff because the, the hot research at the time was saying that uh, there are certain types of people or certain people that just have a depleted level of a chemical called serotonin. So, serotonin is that uh, the happy molecule, the thing that makes us happy. He says that normal people have a normal level of serotonin and then some people just have a, a lower level of serotonin and this is linked to depression. So, this uh, the new finding was that, hey, if you've got lower serotonin, take this drug, an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And if you take this, it's going to bump your levels back up to normal and you're going to be happy again. So, this was fantastic for Johan here. You went to the doctor and within 10 minutes, he had a script for, uh, at the time it was called Seroxat, now it's called Paxil and, you know, problem solved, solution found and he could go on about his life. Yeah, the doctor said it would probably take two weeks for the drugs to really kick in, but Johan felt it straight away. That night, he felt this warm surge running through his body. He says it was like this this chemical kiss. Uh, he'd taken this drug and almost instantly, he felt like the, the world was lighter, the world was brighter, the weight had been lifted off his shoulders, and everything started feeling better again. Yeah, he left for university a few weeks later, had this huge chemical armor on now, and he could go to the bar with confidence and try and pick up. He could study and have a go at his tests with a lot more self-esteem. But however, within a few months, he started to notice that there were a few moments of sadness creeping back in unexpectedly. So, they were kind of irrationally thought, like, why the hell is this mm. happening? So, we went back to the doctor and then they both agreed, look, you need, you need a higher dose of these things. So, we're going to up it from 20 milligrams up to 30 milligrams. Yeah. And so, it continued. Yeah, he'd go through and then instantly, as soon as he got this higher dose, he started feeling better again. But almost predictably a couple of weeks a couple of months later the sadness slowly started to creep back in uh he would gradually bump it up to 35 milligrams a day then 40 then 45 all the way up to 60 milligrams a day so each time it was it was effective each time he did it he'd have this temporary relief but unfortunately at the same time he said uh they had these weird side effects it always made him fatter like each time he did he sort of held more weight he also made him a lot sweatier for whatever reason these drugs were making him sweat a lot but he said hey I'm happy, so it's a price worth paying. If I'm a little bit chubbier, a little bit sweatier, it's mm-hmm. okay because I'm a lot happier each time. Now, Johan, he was uh, he was raving about this to all his mates at the pub. He said, thank God about these drugs. They're remarkably powerful and they work. And he was writing articles about how good they are and everything. So, he was stoked with what was going on here because he had this story that came in two parts. First is what causes depression and it's that it comes from a malfunction in the brain caused by the serotonin deficiency or some kind of glitch in the mental hardware. The second part of the story was what solves it, and that's drugs. So, you take these pills and they repair your brain chemistry back to what it's like for normal people. And he loved this story and it's really what guided him through these early years in life. But then uh, he found this mystery where a couple of years later, he was in his therapist's office talking about how grateful he was for these antidepressants, saying that they were making him so much better in every regard. But the therapist said, that's a bit strange to me you're exhibiting a lot of signs of depression. You're emotionally distressed a lot of the time. It doesn't really sound very different to what your life was like before you took the drugs. And so, this was this weird negative epiphany where he realized that 
No matter how high he kept jacking up his dose, the sadness kept coming back. So there would be this short-term relief, but the unhappiness would eventually return. So he had a mystery here. How could he still be depressed when he was taking this antidepressants? It was a bit of a chink in the armor with that original story that he was so happy about. And if you look at all of Western civilization now, as the years have passed, pills are just been popping everywhere. They're appearing more and more in people's lives, prescribed, approved, recommended. Um, in the US, one in five adults is taking at least one drug for psychiatric problems. One in four middle-aged women is taking antidepressants at any given time. And one in 10 boys in high school is taking a powerful stimulant to make them focus. So these addictions to legal and illegal drugs are so widespread that the life expectancy of white men is declining for the first time in peacetime history in the US. And, and even when scientists test the water supply of these Western countries, they find it's laced with antidepressants because so many of us are taking them, we're pissing them out and, and pooing them out and... I don't know how that gets back into the water supply. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that's the water supply on the way out, not on the way back in. But okay. I think it... Well, I don't know. <laughs> I hope it's not just circling around and coming back in. But, but uh, he says, look, we're literally awash with these drugs, right? And So, that was the one big mystery is how can you be depressed if you're taking antidepressants? The second big mystery is, okay, well, at the same time, uh, as all these pills are going up and up and up, depression and severe anxiety is going up and up and up as well. And I think that's just anecdotally true. If you look at the meta level, uh, the people I speak to, there's a lot more people who are taking antidepressants without any stigma about it. But at the same time around the world, it's, you don't have to be rocket scientists to know anxieties uh, going up at the same rate. And then there's a third mystery. Could something other than bad brain chemistry have been causing depression and anxiety in him and so many other people around the world? And what could this be? In the 1700s, something amazing was happening all around the Western world. There were people that had been paralyzed with pain that were now uh, jumping out of their beds and running once again. It didn't matter what their problem was. If it was a dodgy knee, a sore back, a crook hip. Uh, they were finding these miracle cures and getting back to their normal lives. Uh, and what they found was there was this miracle cure, which was this patented thick rod of metal wrapped in a, inside a, a wooden plank, uh, and they called it the tractor. And it had these special qualities. The company couldn't tell anyone about them um, because, because that was their proprietary secrets. But what would happen was a, a specially trained person would come to your home, they would run this tractor, they'd hover it over your body wherever it was sore, and without ever touching you, they would say, you're going to feel this hot sensation, there's a bit of pain that's being pulled out, the tractor is is stripping the pain away from you. Can't you feel it? Can you feel it? And of course, people would start to feel it, and they'd be magically cured of whatever pain was ailing them. Yeah, there was a bloke here called Rob, he hadn't been able to walk for years, and then they pulled out this tractor, and, it, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he lifted his knee, and he just jumped with glee, and it just kept <laughs> happening with uh, patient after patient but what was this special property it sounded pretty amazing so this bloke in bath in england called dr john uh in 1799 he thought he was going to try and make one of his own so he, he didn't want to pay for the the real tractor but he thought if i just take another piece of metal and stick it inside a piece of wood and hover it over people can that fix them as well and so john he just did a very small not scientific trial by any means but he picked five patients in his ward and he ran this tractor and three of these five patients magically felt that they were cured and even even john knew that this was a piece of crap he just pulled an old <laughs> piece of metal rod from his backyard but somehow it worked and and even john really even john was starting to think is there something about this metal rod and he was starting to be convinced by his own Con. Mate, even I'm starting to think what's this Let's <laughs> <laughs> hop into your backyard. And in a way, they did find a miracle and some kind of magic, but it wasn't the type of miracle you'd think. It was obviously a, a placebo. So a bit like your classic sugar pill. You think you're sick, you take it, you think it's a real pill going in your body. It's actually a whole bunch of sugar, but your whole brain finds a way to actually manipulate your actual body and physiology to be fixed just because what your brain believes. And for this tractor, this metal wooden wand, this placebo, it was actually supported by the fact that so many people around the world were reporting these miracle cures. So, of course, if everyone starts saying this fixed me, the belief goes up and up and up. It's like this positive uh, cycle upwards 
this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy that people realize that, hey, if this magic thing is going to fix me, then if they believe it's going to fix them, the placebo effects helps them convince themselves in their own mind that, hey, this actually works. So let's leave that placebo idea for aside for a second and look at how the companies who are producing these uh, pills, Big Pharma, um, what, how they're going all about it. And one of the things they're doing, is they're running their own trials on their own products. So I didn't realize that. So that means they're setting up their clinical trial and they get to decide who gets to see any of the results and they're the ones judging if they work or not. So they're involving all these poor researchers who have no source of funding whatsoever and they've got little control over the results. And then at the end, again, it's the company who write up the published reports. So now this evidence, uh, evidence I guess in air quotes, this evidence uh, gets sent to the regulators because it's obviously vitally important. You can't just let any new drugs on the market. So there's regulators to check if this uh, trial was legit or not. And one interesting thing that they found that in the US, 40% of regulators' wages are paid by the drug companies. And in the UK, 100% of these regulators are actually funded by drug companies. So the regulators, the client and the researchers are all funded by the one place really and uh, you can imagine how the rules are written in this process and you can say it's extraordinarily easy for them to get a drug approved. All you need is two trials to say, hey, this has some effect and that's it. So, you know, if a company goes out there with a billion bucks, I'm just speaking off cuff here, and has 200 trials or something like that. They can just scrap the other 198 oh. and go, yeah, those two, some effect. <laughs> oh, gosh. There you go, regulators, job yeah. done. And then all of a sudden, they're on the market. Okay, so there's a, a bit of a suggestion that there could be a bit of placebo effect in this, J- just the idea that, hey, if, it, if you think it works and you take it, then your brain tells you that it's going to work and then it does work. And there's some people say, hey, so what? Um, if Even if it's a placebo, it still works. And that's a thing that has been proven all over the world that placebos are actually very, very effective if you believe in them. Uh, but the so what element is saying that, well, actually, there are sometimes these side effects that so just because that's giving you the positive upside of what you're hoping it can do, uh, in a lot of these pills, there could be the, the risk of increased violent behavior. In older people, there's an increased risk of death from pretty much all causes. Uh, everybody's got an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. In pregnant women, there's a risk of miscarriage or birth deformities. And 20% of people actually then later experience withdrawal symptoms when they try to wean off. Yeah, that's some pretty serious effects. So you'd want to hope that the upside is better than all the downside if you're putting drugs like this to market. So let's drill a little bit deeper down into these studies. Johan, he's got a mate called Peter who went to check out some of these clinical trials. And you'd think when a company wants to conduct trials on antidepressants, they've got two big issues that they, they need to solve. First of all, they need to recruit all the volunteers who put their hand up to swallow these new dangerous pills that nobody's been tested on <laughs> for a sustained period. So it's you know, <laughs> that would be a tough one, I tough reckon, one. to convince a lot of people. But at the same time, they're restricted by law to pay small amounts to the volunteers. So, 40 to 75 bucks. Only You'd imagine only the real desperate people might mm. put their hand up to just take the risks there. But it's, for most people, it's probably not enough money to get them over the line. So, when Peter went to this medical trial, what they found was this huge, beautiful glass cube glazed out with expensive houses. And in this place, it was essentially like a five-star hotel. You wake up, you've got this gorgeous buffet just sitting there. You've got therapy. You've got a community of people who are listening to them. You've got a warm place during the day. You've got medication. And you've got a bit of a, enough money to be above the poverty line here. So inside this glass cube, for a lot of people, there's probably a lot more upside mm. just hanging out in there in this trial than out there in, in the world dealing with their problems. And so... In order to actually qualify for this, you also need to have one of the conditions that they're trying to test to cure. But as you say, if the the people that are coming for this are are very, very desperate, um, if they need these 40 bucks, uh, but more importantly, they need to stay in this this fancy five-star hotel-like environment, uh, I suppose it's it's not... uh, explicitly implied but it is definitely implicitly implied that well perhaps uh, if they need to have these serious conditions maybe there there could be a way that they uh, make out that they do have these serious conditions even though they potentially might not because they want to qualify for this trial and then mm. of course if they at the end of the trial they're found to not have these anymore well hey the the test worked 
Yeah. They, they got cured of these conditions. Well, my brain goes to a bit of reciprocity there. If someone's doing all these this free stuff for you, giving you a five-star experience, mm-hmm. seemingly for free, there is a part of the human brain that wants to reciprocate in situations like that. You You'd know start what? to feel pretty good, wouldn't you? If you had gone from living on the streets to living in uh, this expensive house. Yep. Yeah. And they've done that for you and you'd want to reciprocate and pay back the favor. You know what they want? <laughs> they want you to say a certain thing. <laughs> exactly. So, there's people who've actually studied the real effects of these SSRI antidepressants coming from the other end, more objective research. And they found that the drugs, they work 67% of the time, just like Johan, which sounds pretty good. Um, But then they found within half a year, half the patients fully depressed again. Hmm. So, back to square one after six months. And only one in three stayed on the pills, had a lasting proper recovery from depression. So, you think, right, 33% is pretty good. But you got to think, how many of those would have naturally um, gone back to not being depressed without the pills due to potentially situations mm. in their life? So, they're saying that out of all the people that they start, it started working and then it stopped working for them or the people that got better that might have got better anyway, they said when, you, when they worked all that out, these scientific researchers, they actually concluded that, it was, uh, that the antidepressants only worked in this small minority of cases. And in fact... Uh, 65 to 80 percent actually continued to be clinically depressed even while taking these magic antidepressants. Yeah, as we said at the start, we're not psychiatrists. We're just reading the book here by Johan Hari, and no doubt chemical antidepressants is the way to go for some people in the population, for those who are depressed and anxious and for them, the upside and the positives might outweigh the ne- negatives. And if that's the case for you, then you should be carrying on and taking them. But I think we got to ask questions here about is there something else out there that could solve the problem that is somewhat natural? So, Johan Hari, he'd got to this point where he'd gone through his own personal journey uh, with these medications and he got uh, over out the other side and then he thought, well, maybe there is something out there. Maybe it's not that the only solution is to, is to take these drugs. And so, over this three-year journey, he went all over the world, interviewed 200 uh, world-leading scientists and researchers and he, what he wanted to learn was... Uh, a new story, effectively. So, is there is there another story out there aside from just a chemical imbalance that needs to be solved by medication? And across all countries, all cultures, he started to find some of these other things that could be causes of depression and anxiety. So, understanding these nine things by solving these issues, these are real natural antidepressants that are just waiting for us in the way we actually live our lives. They're not something you buy or swallow but they're really a new, different path outside of pain. Joe Phillips here, he works at a paint shop. So, if you walked into this shop in Philadelphia, you'd ask for a gallon of paint and pick the colour and shade, then Joe would pop up and he'd be your man. He'd dash out, grab the pigment in and put the can into a machine. He would shake it vigorously. This made the colour that you wanted. He'd take your money, he'd say, thank you, sir. Then he'd wait for the next customer. And the same thing would happen. He'd take the order, shake paint, thank you, wait, and then repeat. And this was his whole entire day, every day. And no one really noticed if Joe was doing a good or bad job. The only time that the boss commented on what he was doing was the days he rocked up late to work. But Joe always found himself thinking, where's the ability to change here? Where's the ability to grow? Where's the ability to make an impact for this company? And, you know, anyone can show up on time and do what they're told to do. What's special about his job? But at the same time, while he was asking himself these questions, he was also realizing, hey, there's millions or if not billions of people around the world who would literally die for this job. It was reasonable pay. It was safe. It was predictable. Compare that to people living on the other side of the world who didn't have the same privileges that he had. But at the same time, he was thinking, look, there's this a lot of monotony here. He felt like he wasn't growing. He felt like he wasn't doing anything. He felt like there was no joy in it. Um, one time at a party, uh, a mate slipped him an oxytocin. And uh, he felt this interesting, pleasant numbness sort of weighed over him. He sort of enjoyed the rest of his night that night. The bad feelings seemed to just melt away. Uh, and uh, he thought, well, this is, this is sort of a nice night. What if I pop one of these pills when I go to work? I can sort of numb myself. I don't have to uh, worry about all these nagging questions about how I'm just stuck in life and doing something that's meaningless. Um, so gradually, he started effectively just building up and building up and effectively was just popping these oxytocin pills each day he went to work. Yeah, it's his way of numbing the pain so he can get through the day. 
There's a study here between 2011 and 2012. There was a polling company called Gallup who conducted a detailed study about how people feel about their jobs across 142 countries. What they found was 13% were engaged, which means they wake up, they're enthusiastic and committed to work and contribute to their organizations in a positive way. You have 63% who are not engaged. They're kind of just a bit like uh, Joe was, sleepwalking through their day, putting the time in, but not the energy or passion into their work. Interestingly, 24% were actively disengaged. They aren't just unhappy at work. They're busy acting out their unhappiness. Hmm. They're really trying to undermine their business and uh, really tear down the organization and, and put it in the, <laughs> the wrong direction rather than the positive direction. That's it's good. almost a quarter of the population there, man. If you're a business owner or a boss, it's pretty scary to think that almost one in four people are trying to undermine you at every single turn. <laughs> uh, but what's sort of making this even worse is that uh, the idea of a nine-to-five job is a relic of the past. This study found that the average worker checks their email at 7.42 in the morning, they head off to the office at 8.18, and they don't leave the office till 7.19. So this previous nine-to-five is actually now a 7.42 to a 7.19. And I'd say uh, this book's a couple of years old that even now, if everyone's working at home, the lines between work and home are blurred even further. And the disappointing thing about all this is that only 13% are engaged, so 87% of us actually don't enjoy what we're doing throughout most of our day. So, there has been studies to try and find out what makes people happy at their work. So, one was conducted at the British Civil Service and at this place, no one's really poor, no one's really in danger, so they can isolate different things that contribute to enjoyment at work. So, the things that were different here was the differences in status and how much freedom you got at the work. So, who do you think would be most likely to be depressed and overwhelmed? Is it the big dog running the company who's running 100 different people or is it the person 11 steps down the pay scale hanging out by the computer? The obvious guess is that uh, the the boss, the top dog, they uh, have the much more stressful job. They've got they're making massive decisions every single day that dictate the future of the company and the finances and everybody around them. Compare that to the person at the bottom who's just doing the filing. It's uh, There's no big responsibilities. Uh, it doesn't weigh on their life. It's actually quite simple to do. And so, it's a, a quite comfortable, easy job. So, you probably think that the, the person at the top is going to be so stressed out all the time and they're going to be the ones who are the most anxious and the most depressed. So, they spoke to 18,000 civil servants and what they found was the top dog, they'd lean back and take charge of the conversation during the interview, but those down the bottom of the rung, they'd lean forward and wait to be told what to do. And after years of these kind of interviews, they found the results. The people at the very top, the top dogs, they were four times less likely to have a heart attack than the people at the bottom of the ladder. And this is probably the truth of what a lot of people thought. So, if you plotted this in a graph, as your position rose up the ladder, your chance of catching depression fell. So, there is a close correlation and relationship between being depressed and where you stood in the hierarchy. It was quite interesting that they found that the higher up you went, the more friends you had and the more social activity you did after work. And the lower you were, the more that tapered off. They found that the people with the boring, low status, unfulfilling jobs, they were actually quite exhausted at the end of the day. And all they wanted to do was go home, collapse in front of the TV and just zone out. Whereas surprisingly, when the work was more challenging, uh, it was a lot harder work but more enriching, the whole life was fuller and it spilled out into all different areas of their life. So, even though they were working a lot harder throughout the day, they were actually a lot more happy as a result at the end. So, the jobs where people have got no autonomy about what they do, the things that are monotonous, boring, soul-destroying, they die a little bit every day they go to work, so it's a bit like Joe. So, by this standard, you think he's just sitting there um, shaking paint, hanging out, um, chilling out, but by this standard, he's got one of the most stressful jobs that are really out there because it's disempowerment that is at the heart of all this poor health, whether it be physical, mental, or emotional. Loneliness hangs over our culture today like a thick smog. More people than ever say they feel lonely. And Johan was wondering, maybe this is somehow linked to the apparent rise in depression and anxiety. So previously, we had our first cause of depression and anxiety was a disconnection from meaningful work. Now, our second that we're going to look at is a disconnection from other people. 
So in a study, they gave a whole bunch of people cardiovascular monitors to measure the heart rate, but also a little beeper and some tubes. So when you left the lab, you were beeped nine times a day and you had to note how lonely or connected you felt. And second, they recorded your heart rate. When they added these results together, they were kind of startled because feeling lonely caused your cortisol levels to soar and being acutely lonely was as stressful as experiencing a physical attack, kind of literally just as much as you'd be punched by a stranger. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, (laughs) vivid visual representation. If you're feeling uh, lonely, then you're feeling stressed and that's the same level of stress as if someone walked up to you and punched you in the face. (laughs) Gee, I don't know who's... um, I think I'm going to call a little bit of BS on that. I don't know who studied... (laughs) Who did a study with 9,000 people just going out punching people punching in the face? The face. <laughs> okay. So, it's more of a, a hypothetical, I guess, than an actually rigorously tested thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but still, it's stressful. It's, it's stressful. stressful. Yeah, that's the point. They actually found that, say, if you, um, if you plot loneliness on a straight line between zero means you're, um, you're, you're 0% lonely versus 100 where you're 100% lonely, if you move from 50 up to 65, so if you move up uh, one standard deviation, your chances are of developing depressive symptoms increased eight times. So if you become um, this 15% lonelier, you become eight times more depressed. Mm. So this is what the neurochemistry is trying to make us do. So evolution, who invented this neurochemistry, it's got a very strong impulse in the favor of us being connected, hanging out with people and not being lonely because it produces better outcomes of survival. One example is uh, of people who report feeling lonely. They have what... Uh, researchers call micro awakenings. Those are, these are small moments throughout the night. You actually don't feel like you're waking up, um, but maybe just like rise a little bit from your slumber. Uh, all social animals actually do this same thing when they're isolated, and it's because if the or the theory goes that if you feel safe, if you feel connected to other people, if you feel like you're a part of the tribe, then you can comfortably go to sleep without constantly being alert. But if you feel as if you're alone, if you feel like nobody's got your back, then you've sort of almost got to be on alert. Even when you're asleep, you need to be uh, waking yourself up from time to time just to make sure no one's about to slit your throat. Yeah, I see that. I think when uh, I'm sleeping next to Corey, I can probably sleep a little bit better. But when I'm the only one in the house trying to get to sleep, I'm that little bit alert as if someone's going to come in and I need to... Mm whip out some jujitsu on him. <laughs> I made a big error. I started watching this new Netflix show called The Haunting um, and it's the worst show to watch just before bedtime. Mm. It's about ghosts and uh, and uh, mysterious shit. Yeah, I don't know like, what that... I don't think that has anything to do with, uh, with Mike Awakenings but basically don't watch scary shit before you go to sleep. But the point here is that having connections is really important and the trend, it's not looking good, the amount of connections we've got in society because social scientists have looked at this as well. And they've always asked over the years, how many confidence do you have? And which is basically how many people can you turn to in times of a crisis when your life's going to shit? Or you go to them when things, good things start happening to you. And when they first started doing the tests about 30 years ago, the average number was about three people you could go with. By 2004, the most common answer was none. So for most people, they can't just turn to anyone when things go really bad or things go really good. So, there's more time than any time in human history that I think these studies would mm. say in the Western world anyway, mm. have no close friends than any other generation. It's crazy. On top of that, we're also spending much less time with our families. We're eating together far less uh, and most of the time, the, the, the time that we're spending together isn't quality time. It's probably just lounging in front of the TV. There's no deep and meaningful conversations. People are going on vacations far less. So virtually every form of family togetherness is becoming less common. So it's essentially an experiment we're going on here. And hopefully we're not like the poor little lab rats who get the hard end of the deal in pretty much every book. <laughs> but here, some of the rats, they were raised in a cage alone compared to the other ones that were raised in groups. The isolated rats, they developed 84 times the number of breast cancer tumors as the rats who lived in a community. That's a big number. That's massive. <laughs> that, is, that is seriously massive. Uh, and there was another study that found that lonely people 
uh, they found that lonely people detect threats in their environment within 150 milliseconds and socially connected people take twice as long they spot threats in 300 milliseconds. So I guess it's, it's a good thing to spot threats quickly, but what they're saying is that because these lonely people, they've got no support around them, they're fending for themselves, so they're always on edge. They're always looking for something to go wrong, and because they're always looking for it, they spot threats twice as quickly as people who feel more connected and more comfortable. So lots of people are going out there, they're speaking to a lot of people, they're in a cafe ordering coffee, they might be swiping on Tinder, talking on Insta or Facebook or anything like that, but really... What we're talking about here is the sense that you're not able to share anything that matters to you with anybody else. You're just traveling as your only pilot through this world and not sharing it with anyone. So, to end loneliness, you need to have a sense of this mutual aid and protection with at least one other person. Most of us know there's something wrong with our physical diets. More and more people are going out there and eating too many of the wrong things and dirty burgers and donuts and everything (laughs) like that. It's making you physically sick. Literally, I remember the last time I had Mac is three hours later. I'm like, oh, what is that? <laughs> but uh, in investigating depression and anxiety, it's a pretty similar thing going on with our values. And this is making us emotionally sick. For thousands of years, philosophers have been suggesting that if you overvalue possessions or money, uh, if you think of life mainly in terms of these physical possessions, then you'll be unhappy. Nobody had yet done an experiment to see if those philosophers were right, but if You know, people have been talking for thousands of years about it. It's probably true. Uh, And so, this next cause of depression and anxiety that they wanted to investigate was a disconnection from meaningful values. So, there was a survey conducted at a grad school and they measured how much the people out there value things like money compared to other values like spending time with your family or trying to make the world a better place. And they called it the aspiration index. So, it was pretty straightforward. You ask people, do you agree with statements like, it is important to have expensive possessions and then how much they agree with other things like it is important to make the world a better place. So, that was one axis. The second axis that they looked at was the level of depression and the anxiety. When they added those results up, they found uh, quite convincingly, quite overwhelmingly that the more you place value on things, the more likely you are to be suffering from depression and anxiety. So, what this ties into is the different ideas about of motivation. The first type of motivation comes from internal things. That's your intrinsic motivation. They're the things that you do because you value them uh, in and of themselves. You're not doing them to get anything out of them. It's like when kids are playing, they're doing it because it's fun. It's like if, you're, if you want to spend time with your family, if you want to make the world a better place, those are intrinsic motivations. Or on the flip side, you've got extrinsic motivations. So, these aren't things that you're doing because you want to do them. These are the things you feel like you have to do them because you're going to get something back. Maybe that's money, maybe that's admiration, maybe that's status, maybe that's sex. Uh, these are the things that you're doing in order to get something outside of yourself. So, one way to illustrate that is say if you're playing the piano, uh, if you're doing it for intrinsic motives, you're doing it because you just love doing it, um, you really enjoy it. If you're doing that for extrinsic motives, maybe you play at a dodgy old bar on a Saturday night and you get a bit of extra money on the side, so you're doing it for the money. So, the results of the study show that those with these extrinsic goals, they wanted to go out there and just make as much bucks as they possibly can. They wanted to go out and pick up. They wanted to go out and get all sorts of status. Their day-to-day happiness didn't increase whatsoever. So, they spent a huge amount of of energy chasing these goals for the pay rise and anything that increases status. But when they fulfilled them, it felt like they went back to the start. So, it's a lot like the hedonic treadmill, which we talk a lot about. Once you're on the treadmill, you reach that level of, or you buy that material possession, then when you get it, you're back to normal and you're back on the treadmill and it's never ending. Yeah, you you work so hard for this promotion, the fancy car, the iPhone, but as soon as you get it, you don't actually experience any increase in happiness. Contrast that to people who achieve intrinsic goals. So, the people who are doing things like maybe they, they want to become a better parent, they want to go dancing on the weekend because they love doing it, they like to help other people out. They found that people who achieve these intrinsic goals are actually significantly happier and they're far less depressed and anxious. And you can really track, the, track it very obviously, people who are doing things for external gain versus people who are doing it because they want to do it. Yeah, it's a bit of common sense, I think, but sometimes you need some of those researchers and studies <laughs> out there to back up your old school Marcus Aurelius type philosophers to just whack us over the head with it. 
because we've been shifting from eating food to junk food in the exact same way we've been shifting from meaningful values to junk values. So it's kind of like having Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's the equivalent that a lot of people have with their values at the moment. Let's have a look back at our man, Joey, the paint shaker, if you remember him. Uh, Joey, he actually, before he started shaking paint uh, and before he started working at this job, he had this strange goal where he loved fishing and he wanted to go and catch a fish in all 50 states of the US. Uh, He wanted to do this. It was like his bucket list thing before he died. Uh, He'd already done half uh, and he'd been offered a job as a fishing guide in Florida. Uh, It was going to be a bit less pay, but it was going to be a hell of a lot more enjoyable. So if you think about those two options, one, he was initially driven by, he said he wanted to buy the Mercedes, buy the extra garage, buy the tennis court so that his neighbors would look at him and say, hey, you've done well. And he thought that would make him happy. But really, if he was to actually go out there, move to Florida, go and catch fish, something he loved doing for the joy of doing it, perhaps he would find that better connection to those meaningful values. So in our culture, a lot of us are going after the stuff and the superior status as opposed to the things that are making us intrinsically happy. And really the gap between yourself and society and the stuff and the status that you're desiring is going to cause the increase in your depression and the anxiety as these needs go unmet. It seems hard to describe what depression and anxiety actually feel like it seems like because it's a it's an emotional thing it's outside the realm of the logic of language but one thing people often say is i'm feeling down i feel down Uh, and so one day robert sapolsky he was uh hanging out with baboons he went over to africa and was living in these troops in kenya he found these there was these two very different baboons one you got the the big VIP, the king of the jungle. He was the top of the troop. His name was Solomon. He was like the, uh, in the Bible, Solomon was the wise old king in the Old Testament. Uh, The baboons lived in this strict hierarchy and Solomon was at the top. He could do whatever he wanted. He could take food off people. He could have sex with any of the females he wanted. Uh, And in fact, half of the sexual activity in the whole uh, troop was uh, involving Solomon, Mm. the, the great man Solomon. If you're a female baboon, you wanted to uh, you wanted to have Solomon's child because you want to be linked at the top of the hierarchy. Now, at the other side of things, we've got a, a poor little baboon named Job. Now, Job, he named him after the unluckiest man in the Bible. Job would tremble a lot anytime somebody else looked at him. It looked as if he was having a bit of a seizure because... Uh, anyone who was having a bad day, they took it out on Job. They'd snatch his food, they'd shove him, they'd beat him up a lot. He was low status. He uh, got no women. No one wanted to go near him. Uh, And so you've got Solomon, who's at the top, and then you've got poor Job, who's way at the bottom. We're just saying before this episode, what a... I know there's a lot of people out there named Job, (laughs) but uh, I think you'd... Yeah, after the unluckiest man in the Bible. Yeah. Don't know about that name. Yeah. Probably look a bit harder. They must have read it. But in between Solomon and Job, you got everybody else, the whole chain of command. And Robert Sapolsky here, he'd fire a tranquilizer dart at the baboons to take a blood sample and he'd test it for different key factors. So it turned out that when a war is going on, the position of the alpha male, Solomon, he was the most stressed baboon out of all the ones in the group. But the baboons at the bottom, the ones at the bottom of the pile, the losers like Job, they're constantly stressed. So to avoid getting savaged by Solomon, getting bitten up and slapped up and everything, Joe would have to just always communicate low status and just show that they knew where they existed on the hierarchy, uh, looking defeated the whole time. Yeah, he'd drop his head, he'd, uh, he wouldn't look up at anyone, he'd have shock and posture. It was just his signal saying, hey, please stop attacking me, You've, I give up, I know I'm at the bottom, you don't have to rub it in. Then uh, one day we got a new, new baboon came along, his name was Uriah. He went right up to King Solomon and did something wild. Solomon was hanging out with all his babes. Uriah just took one of his girls and started having sex right in front of Solomon. Mm. And now that pissed Solomon off. <laughs> He's yeah, got his harem his birds, of baboons yeah. there. And this little young up-and-comer comes along and starts ruining one of his women. And uh, Solomon attacked him. They broke out into a big fight and Solomon ripped his lip off. So that wouldn't be too good. But mm. uh, So Uriah sort of went away. The next day he came back and had another crack. And there was a, a fight broke out again. Solomon kept winning. But on about day four or five, Uriah had kept coming back, kept coming back. Solomon was a bit older, so he was getting a bit exhausted by this all. And Uriah actually won. Uriah won the fight and effectively became the king. Now, the whole group 
turned on poor Solomon. He used to be the king. He's very quickly slipped down to the bottom, down to those Job levels, uh, and his stress went through the roof. So the whole point of all these tranquilizer darts is to find out when people are most stressed. And it really comes in two situations. When status is threatened, like Uriah or Solomon, also when your status is low, like the loser Job. Yeah, so they found that if you're at the top, whenever there's a challenge, you know, whenever there's a war or you've got this young up-and-comer trying to take your spot, that's very stressful. But for the rest of the time when things are calm, if you're at the bottom, everything just sucks basically. Yeah, and you've got to wonder if depression is in part response to the sense of humiliation that we've all got in the modern world. We flick on Instagram, you watch TV, you chuck on YouTube, Pretty much all you're exposed to is just all the Solomons of the world, Mm. but to an extreme extent. You're not like dealing with 20 people in the group. You're dealing with the top 0.001%. And when you're watching all those people absolutely killing it, you probably just feel like like, a bit like Job. You're wondering, why aren't I doing as good as these people? Mm. In reality, you probably are to the scale of 20 to 30 people, but you wouldn't even know it. Mm. Yeah, imagine like if you were... uh if you're scrolling through Instagram, you're following all the top followers with millions of followers who've got the perfect bodies and then you look in the mirror, you'd be feeling pretty humiliated. Or if you're watching The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and seeing all these rich people with their mega mansions flying around in their, their fancy helicopters and then you take a sideways glance from your TV and you see you've got that hole in the wall and you're living <laughs> on this shitty little old couch and and uh, those things would be pretty humiliating. If you're always comparing yourself to the top of the top of the top, all of a sudden you're feeling like poor poor little Job. So, some human cultures like the US have very large gaps between the people at the top and the bottom. It's a very unequal society. There's a small amount of Solomons, a whole bunch of Jobs hanging out at the bottom. But other countries like Norway have a lot more equality. So, for them, it's like they're hanging out in the middle of the hierarchy. So, if you plot it on a graph, the societies that are more unequal have a much more prevalence of mental illness than the societies that are much more equal. So, the higher the inequality the higher the depression. So the author, Johan Hari, he'd gone through his own sort of personal journey, riding the the wave of taking SSRIs and gradually ramping them up, but each time depression came back. So he wanted to look out and find if there were other causes of depression other than that common story of there was just a chemical imbalance. So what he found was nine disconnections that led to an increase in depression and anxiety. We covered four of them. We covered uh, the disconnection from meaningful work, the disconnection from other people, the disconnection from meaningful values, and the disconnection from status. There was actually nine in the book, and so there was uh, there was five that we didn't cover that might resonate with you uh, strongly as well. One is the disconnection from childhood trauma. There was a 1998 study that found that the more traumatic a person's childhood was, the more likely they were to have depression and anxiety as an adult. Another is disconnection from nature. So more experiences you have in nature, the less stress people have. And there's a lot of research here around biophilic design. The more natural that a building is, the better health benefits that the occupiers have. There's also the disconnection from a secure and hopeful future. They found that the Native Americans who lived on these government-controlled reservations had staggeringly high suicide rates, uh, whereas in reservations where they had control of their own laws, their own elections, their own police, their own schools, uh, suicide wasn't a problem at all. So they found that if you had a a hopeful future, if you saw uh, light at the end of the tunnel, if you saw something bright and shiny on the horizon, then you're far less depressed. Eight is genes. So there is a genetic influence on depression that people have that genuinely isn't your fault and there's nothing you can do about but this is only accounts for about 37 percent of cases and then the ninth was changes in the brain so the neuroplasticity our brain is constantly changing and adapting to our environment and our experiences and they found that because of this when people spend more time stuck in their thoughts of despair rather than joy it actually strengthens the negative feeling areas of the brain so the book isn't saying that all antidepressants are bad There are some credible scientists that are arguing that they give much-needed temporary relief for a minority of users, and this shouldn't be dismissed whatsoever. But it's a false story to claim that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain and that the primary slash only solution is for people to go out there and just get more chemical antidepressants. Now, that story um, has been a good story for Big Pharma, who are raking in $100 billion a year from selling chemical antidepressants. 
But again, it's something that we should just be a little skeptical of and consider maybe there are other things beyond just this story that these pharmaceutical companies are, are spreading. So you're not necessarily suffering from a chemical imbalance in your brain. Much of what everyone's been told now, it's all serotonin, you're suffering a social and spiritual imbalance in how we live. So this is what Johan, he'd tell his teenage self that day when he was 18 years old and depressed and didn't know what to do about it. So you're not a machine with broken parts. You're an animal whose needs are not being met. You need to have a community. You need meaningful values, not the junk values. You need meaningful work. You need the natural world. You need to feel you're respected. You need a secure future and connection to all of these sorts of things. We got a review that came in from Poland. This one is from Kubak. Uh, love reading these reviews. We read all of those that come in. Thankfully, another five-star uh, laid back, but extremely informative. A big thank you. You're doing such a great job talking about such amazing books and extracting the most important bits in such an entertaining and fun way. I could listen to you for hours and not get bored. Please keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Kubak from Poland. Thank you to anyone who leaves us a review. We read them all. Uh, or if you send us an email, we read them all as well, podcast at whatyouwillearn.com or on our new website, whatyouwillearn.com. Uh, you'll see a contact us button. You can send a, send a form in and just uh, a couple of sentences on some of your favorite books, some of your favorite episodes, what you like, what you don't like. We love reading it all. Thank you so much.